International News Now. Okay, so over the past few weeks, the United States and Saudi Arabia have been embroiled in an increasingly heated controversy over the disappearance and death of Saudi dissident journalist Jamal uh, Khashoggi. And since his death occurred in Turkey, the Turkish government has also played a prominent role in this crisis. And in fact, uh, President Erdogan gave a uh, speech this morning, uh, or this morning our time, uh, about this uh, crisis and called on those who were arrested in, for this uh, killing to be tried in Turkey, which is going to be a controversial um, proposition, to say the least. So we're going to talk about this crisis, and we're going to get into the details of the scandal uh, in a little while. But first, we want to provide some background uh, information about one individual who lies at the very center of this story, and that is the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, our uh, MBS. He's known uh, in his own country as well as internationally by his initials, right? And so it is... Uh, uh, his possible role in the death of Jamal Khashoggi that makes this issue such an uh, important potential crisis for U.S. relations with Saudi Arabia. So MBS is the de facto leader of Saudi Arabia. He kind of uh, runs the show on the day-to-day -day level. Um, and Saudi Arabia has long been an important ally of the United States. So what happens to MBS and how he either weathers this crisis or somehow is marginalized by it has direct and important implications for the United States. So MBS is the son of King Salman. He was made heir apparent to the Saudi throne in June of 2017 when King Salman removed the prior crown prince, his older brother, uh, Mohammed bin uh, Najib, uh, from uh, all of his positions. And so we're going to begin with a video clip from CNN that provides some background on MBS and his central role in contemporary Saudi Arabian politics. Uh, and then we'll talk about this some more. So let's go ahead and run that clip now. This 33-year-old is the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. He's one of the most powerful men in the Middle East, but is he a progressive reformer bringing a deeply conservative kingdom into the 21st century or a brutal hardliner silencing dissenters? Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS, is at the center of a huge international controversy. Saudi Arabian journalist Jamal Khashoggi went missing in early October 2018 after entering a Saudi consulate in Istanbul and the world's attention is directed squarely at Mohammed bin Salman and those connected to him. As of mid-October, Saudi Arabia has denied involvement in the case. MBS is no stranger to power. He's held significant roles in politics since 2007. Royalty runs in his blood. Saudi Arabia's royal family has a big family tree, but for now, we'll just focus on three of them. The late King Abdullah, the current King Salman, and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. King Abdullah served as King of Saudi Arabia from 2005 until he died in 2015. That's when his half-brother Salman bin Abdulaziz took over the throne. After governing Riyadh for nearly 50 years, he became King of Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, MBS was busy working for state bodies, and he eventually became Minister of Defense. Just after his father became king in 2015, Mohammed bin Salman was named head of the Crown Prince Court. And in June 2017, he was promoted to Crown Prince. Which brings us to today. Here's what he's done so far. Mohammed bin Salman may be most known for leading the kingdom's Game of Thrones-style royal purge. Back in November 2017, he locked up hundreds of wealthy Saudis in a luxury detention center in what he described as an anti-corruption campaign. Others saw it as a way for MBS to eliminate his potential rivals in a quest for power. But he's also been seen as one of the most socially progressive leaders in Saudi history. Over the summer of 2018, MBS granted Saudi women the right to drive. You can't talk about the Saudi economy without talking about oil. The country has made a fortune off of it, and while the highly anticipated Aramco IPO launch continues to hit bumps in the road, the Crown Prince is looking for ways to diversify its economy, making the nation less reliant on oil revenue. 
And then there's the threat of a nuclear Middle East. MBS recently said the kingdom would, quote, act quickly to secure a nuclear bomb if Iran developed one of its own. Mohammed bin Salman's rapid rise to power opened the door for him to visit with some of America's top leaders. In early 2018, MBS visited the U.S. to meet American CEOs and tour major tech companies. Some say MBS's reign as crown prince is the start of a transformation in Saudi Arabia. Others say he's a ruthless autocrat seeking to consolidate power within the kingdom. Either way, his influence in the region is undeniable. But his involvement in the potential death of Jamal Khashoggi is threatening his progressive image and jeopardizing Saudi Arabia's financial relationships throughout the world. A variety of media companies and leaders canceled their plans to attend the country's investment conference, often called Davos in the Desert. And there are growing calls for the U.S. to punish Saudi Arabia if the allegations are true. MBS has survived several scandals, but more than ever, Middle Easterners are asking, can the crown prince hold on to power? Just days before he visited the U.S. back in March 2018, he spoke with CBS 60 Minutes. When asked if anything could stop him from ruling, he responded, only death. So let me talk about a couple major points here. First thing to realize is that MBS has consolidated a lot of power in Saudi Arabia over a very short period of time. He now holds the following positions in the Saudi government. First Deputy Prime Minister, President of the Council for Economic and Development Affairs, and the Minister of Defense. In this position as Minister of Defense, he oversees Saudi participation in the current war in Yemen. He's only 32, maybe 30, 33 now, and so he could rule Saudi Arabia 40 or 50 years. Second, MBS is instrumental to the broader strategic goals of the United States and the Middle East. Most importantly, the Crown Prince has taken a very confrontational approach against Iran and the country's growing political influence in the Middle East. Consequently, MBS is key to President Trump's broader strategy of containing Iranian influence in the region. Many argue that the Trump administration has tended to overlook signs of autocratic behavior by MBS due to the strategic benefits that he could provide in the region on Iran and other issues such as global oil markets and combating terrorism. Now, third, since taking office last summer, the Crown Prince has overseen a radical program of rapid domestic reform in Saudi Arabia that holds the potential to remake Saudi Arabia, its relationship with the United States, and the broader Middle East. These reforms made MBS a potentially attractive partner for the Trump administration because they held out the possibility that the Crown Prince could be a vehicle for progressive change in Saudi Arabia. So let me emphasize two of the most important set of reforms that he's pursued in Saudi Arabia. First, MBS has pushed an important liberalization of women's rights. Women were allowed to drive for the first time this past summer. He also relaxed restrictions on how women dress in public. And MBS wants to enact legislation that could equalize the pay that women and men receive. These significant reforms have been getting lots of attention and support in the West. Second, MBS has also introduced a series of economic reforms, and they center on altering Saudi dependence on oil exports and global oil prices and diversifying Saudi Arabia's Saudi Arabia's economy. Now, this has been prompted in part by the shale oil revolution in the United States. In late 2015, world oil prices had dropped to less than $40 a barrel. Before the financial crisis in 2008, oil prices were at about $140 a barrel. So the fall in oil prices over the period from 2008 to 2015 created the conditions for a potential crisis in the Saudi economy, in part because many things in Saudi Arabia are heavily subsidized by the government. So when the government's revenues fall because of declining oil prices, it's hard, though, to cut back on spending on social services. Such social spending by the government is part of a grand political bargain in Saudi Arabia. People tolerate restrictions on political participation and their liberty because the government provides significant social welfare services. However, potential financial crises due to the volatility of global oil markets could call that social contract into question. Now, at the same time, MBS has carried out these reforms with a heavy hand that shows an intolerance for criticism and dissent. 
Last while many have welcomed the reforms of MBS, particularly when it comes to women's rights. Many, including Jamal Khashoggi, have criticized the Crown Prince and the royal family for not engaging in more democratic reform. And the death of Khashoggi has only reinforced these fears. The Crown Prince's autocratic nature was on full display in several major policy decisions. First, in November of 2017, MBS launched a major anti-corruption purge. During this purge, hundreds of princes and government ministers were arrested and held at the Ritz-Carlton, a five-star hotel in Riyadh, until they proved their innocence or gave back money they had stolen from the Saudi state. There was rumors of torture, too, in, in this little episode. So, uh, This process took back over $100 billion of money from these individuals. Besides sending a message against corruption, this helped MBS consolidate his power and eliminate political rivals to his rule. But this heavy-handed treatment of the Saudi elite also frightened Western investors who feared that they could face similar treatment if MBS turned on them. Second, under MBS, Saudi Arabia has participated in the Yemeni, in the Yemeni civil war to defeat the Houthis and limit Iranian influence in its neighbor. Saudi military operations in Yemen have helped to create a humanitarian crisis there. Thousands of civilians have been killed in the civil war, and a Saudi economic blockade of Yemen contributed to the larger famine in that country. Now, the United States has supported Saudi military efforts there because it views them as consistent with the broader war against terrorism and consistent with the efforts to contain Iran. The U.S. military has conducted numerous military operations in Yemen, attacking al-Qaeda al cells there. However, this support for American military efforts in Yemen is not without its controversy. Some U.S. senators have pushed the Trump administration to withdraw American military support for Saudi military actions in Yemen. And of course now there's the Khashoggi affair, which strongly suggests that Saudi Arabia engaged in a targeted killing in a foreign country of one of its citizens because its citizen criticized the regime. The fact that this individual was a well-known and highly regarded journalist highlights the Saudi government's poor record on press freedoms and violence towards journalists. And just to give you some sense of the impact of Khashoggi, he had over 2 million Twitter followers in the Middle East. Um, if you take Jake Tapper as a comparison, I was looking at his Twitter feed this morning, 1.9 million followers. So he was an extremely high profile journalist in the Arab world. Right, and the, and the commentary after his disappearance uh, was that he was really well liked, really well connected in Washington with journalists, with policymakers, and the like. And so, and he was writing for the Washington in the Post, Post. Right. This is a this was an employee of a major news military or, or news organization of the United States. Right. And he was the resident of the United States. He was on an O visa, which is referred to as the genius visa. He's people of extraordinary talent get these visas for temporary uh, residence in the United States. He was applying for a green card for permanent residence in the United States. And so, uh, yeah, he has really close ties to the U.S. He has several kids who have uh, children who have, um, who are citizens of the United States. And so, so this person is, is uh, quite uh, well regarded and, and um, you know, famous, right? I mean, he, he had a lot of influence. So uh, now we're going to move on to talk a bit about the details of uh, the disappearance of Jamal uh, Khashoggi and the changing narratives that were offered by the Saudi government after his uh, disappearance. So first, let's talk briefly about uh, Jamal Khashoggi as we just started. He was a journalist, well-known critic of the Saudi government. For the past year, like we said, he's, he's lived and worked in Washington, uh, D.C., uh, for the Washington Post, and uh, is a well-regarded uh, journalist that has um, a lot of influence, both here in the United States, but also, uh, more importantly, in Saudi Arabia and uh, the broader Middle East. His articles for the Washington Post uh, were, by and large, critical of uh, the Saudi ruling family and the regime, but uh, the commentary that I've heard and, and read about him is that he wasn't uh, a radical, if you will, calling for revolution or overturn of the system, but rather kind of a within-system uh, reformer type who called for more gradual reforms. Uh, now, these articles, and this was a point made um, on NPR a few days ago, uh, 
his articles for the Washington Post were translated into Arabic uh, by that newspaper, and that raised his profile back in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East more generally, and it perhaps brought some increased scrutiny from the Saudi government. And so his move to the Washington Post actually made him uh, even more of a target, if you will, uh, by the Saudi government. So uh, Jamal Khashoggi disappeared on October 2nd uh, from or in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey. Now, why was he there? Uh, it was reported that he went to the consulate with his fiance to fill out paperwork in order to get married uh, 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 to this Turkish uh, woman who accompanied him to their consulate. And so he went into the consulate alone. I just read this this morning. And she waited outside for five hours for him. And then she called the police. And so it was a pretty frightening situation for her, I'm sure. And so um, now after Khashoggi disappeared, there were a number of competing narratives offered by uh, Saudi authorities. Um, now, Turkish authorities, uh, they uh, provided a narrative that accused Saudi Arabia of harming Khashoggi almost immediately, and that Saudi government denied these claims quite vehemently, and, uh, but then over time con kind of continued to change its story of what the explanation for his dis disappearance uh, was. And so to try to sort out some of these details, we're going to show you a clip from the New York Times. Uh, that centers on the changing Saudi explanation, uh, explanations for uh, Khashoggi's disappearance. So let's roll that clip now. Denials, botched interrogations, fistfights. Ever since Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi disappeared after entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, the kingdom has given all kinds of explanations about what happened and who is responsible. And then in an early Saturday morning announcement, Saudi Arabia confirmed for the first time that Khashoggi is dead. They say he died after an argument and fistfight with unidentified men in the consulate. It's the latest in a series of changing narratives from Saudi authorities. First, Saudi Arabia said Khashoggi left the consulate and expressed concern about his well-being. <laughs> Government-aligned Turkish media said he was brutally murdered by 15 Saudi hitmen. They even released their names and images. Saudi Arabia then started pushing back. In two statements, it denounced baseless allegations and called them lies. As the accusations and evidence mounted, the Saudis started getting more forceful in their denials, and their messages took on a threatening tone. Like in this tweet from the foreign ministry, saying, demise is the outcome of these weak endeavors. The tweet was mysteriously deleted the next day. As of this moment, they deny it. When Trump said there would be... And there will be severe punishment. Saudi Arabia lashed out, saying it rejected threats. More reports continued to come out. Some of them were grisly. On the recordings, you can hear Khashoggi was detained when he entered, killed and dismembered. One official saying you can hear how he was interrogated, tortured and murdered. That's when the Saudis seemed to be testing out an eyebrow raising theory and using President Trump to help sell it. It sounded to me like maybe these could have been rogue killers, who knows? Then yet another twist. Sources close to Saudi Arabia started teasing the idea that yes, Khashoggi was dead, but it was because of an interrogation gone wrong. But they also continued to maintain the king and crown prince had no knowledge of it. The Saudis say they're investigating, and when Secretary of State Mike Pompeo arrived in Saudi Arabia, there were smiles and pleasantries. It looked like business as usual. But after the head-spinning stories about a suspected gory murder by a key U.S. ally, it was anything but. Okay, so let me make a few points about this. Uh, first, Turkey. Turkey's government, um, right after the disappearance, started making strong claims that uh, Saudi government and security officials played a key role in uh, Khashoggi's death. The Turkish officials uh, 
put out a story with pictures and, and identities of uh, a 15 person hit squad in their words uh, that made that was made up of members of the Saudi security apparatus uh, which arrived in Turkey earlier uh, either the day before or on the day of October 2nd uh, on uh, a couple of commercial flights but also some private uh, jets that were leased by the Saudi government now Turkey is also issued kind of in a gradual way kind of drip 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 um, over the past three weeks, uh, some details about that they had about uh, this incident. And it suggested a, a, quite a grisly murder of Khashoggi in which Saudi operatives um, uh, uh, severed his fingers, according to one a report, and even beheaded and dismembered his body. Um, the most uh, recent report also, and this came out um, I think this morning or, or last night, uh, from Turkey accused uh, Saudi Arabia of using a body double to stand in for uh, Jamal Khashoggi after the murder occurred. And surveillance images uh, leaked by Turkey show a, a Saudi operative uh, who was apparently wearing some of uh, Khashoggi's clothes after he was killed and uh, left the building, uh, presumably to kind of create a misleading trail of evidence uh, suggesting that he didn't, uh, that he left uh, the consulate. Uh, now, this all suggests um, a cover up uh, by Saudi Arabia, and it undermines uh, that government's claims that it was an accidental death following a fist fight. Um, so, the initial reaction from Saudi Arabia was a strong denial of any involvement. Uh, but then uh, it started to change its story. And first, it floated this idea of a rogue. Killers that uh, murdering Khashoggi, and this was the clip that um, uh, showed that the President uh, Trump kind of picked up on this uh, narrative. But eventually, the Saudi government acknowledged that it played a role in the death, uh, but not denies any knowledge that the King or the Crown Prince uh, was involved. And they do this in ways of, of just um, by arresting uh, up to what 18 people for the uh, incident, and also talking about a um, interrogation that went badly, um, kind of trying to pin it on these um, officials who were uh, engaged in the interrogation. And so, um, of course, the reaction has been met with great skepticism because it seems infeasible uh, that a lower level operative would take this kind of provocative act of killing a well-known journalist uh, without approval by someone at the highest level. So. So let's now turn to the reaction from President Trump to the crisis. And Trump's reaction has also taken some interesting turns. And so we're going to start with a short clip that compiles the president's reaction to this crisis. So let's go ahead and roll that clip. They have arrested a large number of people. And uh, good first step. Yeah. Well, I think it's a good first step. It's a big step. It's a lot of people, a lot of people involved. And I think it's a great first step. Saudi Arabia has been a great ally. But what happened is unacceptable. Congress is very interested in this one, and we'll be working with Congress. But I would prefer uh, if there is going to be some form of sanction or what we may determine to do, if anything, uh, because this was a lot of people they're talking about, and people pretty high up. But I would prefer that we don't use as retribution uh, canceling $110 billion worth of work, which means 600,000 jobs. Okay, so, so as you can see from the clips, there's kind of two messages. One, that, that uh, this incident is unacceptable. He, he, he stated that, but that he wants to sort of uh, provide some um, time to let the investigation go on. He, he also sends signals that in which he trusts every time the Saudi uh, government denies that they um, were, had any part of this, that, that he sort of accepts uh, those denials, uh, which is not uh, the way that other U.S. Um, officials have reacted. And so he, he has been softer, arguably, on and, and less critical uh, on Saudi Arabia than um, many want uh, Trump to be and, and, and many may have uh, expected him to be. And so there's been a lot of debate about why this is the case. And of course, you, you saw the clip at the end about um, a financial interest in uh, the U.S.-Saudi-Arabian uh, relationship and, he, and, and 
President Trump has made a very made it very explicit that there has been a huge uh, arms deal between the United States and Saudi Arabia, a 110 billion dollar arms deal, and and what he has uh, said is that he, uh, if there is any sanctions or if there is any punishment of Saudi Arabia in light of this incident, he would prefer it not to involve this arms deal because. It, for two reasons, he argues. One is because it would hurt U.S. jobs, right? It, you know, this is a, a big deal that he has trumpeted when it first got signed, um, and uh, and so it would hurt the economy of the United States. He also argues that Saudi Arabia could just go somewhere else, and so they're going to get their weapons anyway, and they've got other alternatives, and so there wouldn't be anything really achieved by ending such a deal. Um, and so. It's interesting that he emphasizes this. I think that's partly a political decision because he thinks that that would, um, uh, you know, be easy to understand and, and kind of compelling for some of his core supporters. Um, but also, uh, it's very clear as he when he just says, you know, these words about Saudi Arabia being a really good and long-standing ally, that there is a a, a strategic uh, element to. Trump's careful parsing of his criticisms of Saudi Arabia. He uh, sees Saudi Arabia as a crucial ally uh, of his administration and his administration's strategy uh, to contain Iran in particular, and that he doesn't want uh, even a crisis of this magnitude to necessarily uh, upset that broader uh, strategy. And, and it should be noted that other controversies like jailing or you know arresting uh, the Saudi uh, elite in the uh, hotel in, in Riyadh didn't get a lot of criti criticism from uh, President Trump. He, he sort of looked past that. Um, and also the uh, criticism of Saudis, Saudi Arabia's intervention in uh, Yemen, which has uh, brought on a lot of uh, scrutiny. Uh, Trump has not seen that as a reason to change the relationship with Saudi Arabia either. And so it is pretty consistent in, in this way, and I think it's for strategic reasons. Well, and the other thing to emphasize here is there is important personal dynamics to this relationship. Right. Jared Kushner, the, the Trump family, has close ties to MBS. Right. Going back to before they, before they came into the administration, the Trump administration has signaled consistently its support for the reforms and the takeover that MBS has um, made within the Saudi government over the last 18 months. And so the U.S. has, in a oh, sense, yeah. rubber stamped this and is, oh, with, yeah. and is with MBS. And so this MBS is... MBS is their guy. Yes. And, and there was a story in the New York Times this morning about how, about how President Trump and the Trump administration, Jared Kushner, sort of tapped him and before he became crown prince and, and gave an audience to him when he was deputy yes. crown prince, which was really uh, out of uh, the ordinary and because he, they wanted him to yeah. be. And it's important, these connections that MBS has with the U.S. administration, they then send signals to other officials in the Saudi government, right. which is if you want to have close ties, the U.S. is picking MBS. So right. you should support MBS as well. Um, so that's why there's that's why it's hard to unravel all of that and and say well now that there's some evidence that you know he the first reaction is to protect him mm -hmm. that because they have sort of latched on to that person as the future leader uh, for a very long time of Saudi Arabia and it's important to realize in the broader strategic objective where was Trump's first foreign trip Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Arabia right that was a signal about the threat posed by Iran, and it was designed on the trip, visiting Saudi Arabia and visiting Israel to shore up um, America's ties with those allies. And this was also a critique, a rebuke of Obama's grand strategy. Um, so MBS is critical to that reorientation of American grand strategy. So one That's thing, this and this is why this is so significant, yeah. So one thing to note here is that congressional reaction to President Trump's lack of strong denunciations of Saudi Arabia has been met, has been swift and bipartisan. Members of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, um, are calling for stronger opposition and potential sanctions against Saudi Arabia. There's been significant Republican pushback. Bob Corker, the chair of the Senate, Lindsey Graham, who's been a strong 
supporter of the president on other issues, said he was very skeptical of the Saudis and called for an American investigation and potential sanction. He said MBS has to go. Yeah. Um, that the U.S. can't stand with MBS, which is a significant break from the administration. I mean, not that it has a lot of credibility here. Um, Senator Rand Paul has called on the Trump administration to end arms sales to Saudi Arabia, among other sanctions. But the key thing to say is that he's getting pushback from Republicans yes. on this. This isn't just a, a Democratic, yeah. you know, partisan issue, right? Ben Sass, the senator from Nebraska, has been sharply critical of the Saudis, saying pointedly in the first when they said, well, this was a fist fight gone wrong, and Ben Sass responded, you don't bring a bone saw to a fist fight basically saying the Saudis had planned they're on killing him. Yes, they're lying and they <laughs> yeah. had planned on killing him. Now, obviously, congressional Democrats have been very critical of President Trump on this issue as well. Senator Dianne Feinstein has called on Congress to act to punish Saudi Arabia if President Trump will not. She's called for Congress to reject the $110 billion arms sale to Saudi Arabia that, strong, that Trump has strongly asserted should not be part of any sanctions against Saudi Arabia. She's also called for suspending any U.S. support for the Saudi intervention in Yemen and perhaps applying sanctions on any individual found to be involved in the killing of Khashoggi. Finally, there's also been a bipartisan effort to force the Trump administration to launch an investigation through the Global Magnitsky Act. This is a law signed by President Obama in 2012 that originally applied to Russia in the aftermath of coercion by Russian authorities against a lawyer who had defied Putin's regime. This law lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, died in prison due to questionable circumstances. The Magnitsky Act enabled Congress to compel the president to launch an investigation against individuals, including state officials, credibly accused of human rights abuses, such as extrajudicial killings. In 2016, President Obama signed an extension of the law that extended it to any individual around the world accused of human rights abuses. Congress has initiated the Global Magnitsky Act by sending a letter signed by 22 Republican and Democratic members of Congress requesting an investigation of the Khashoggi affair and potential sanctions against any individuals found guilty of coercion against Khashoggi, including the highest Saudi officials. What does this mean? They are opening the door to level sanctions against MBS. Yeah, this isn't over, right? And so, so anyway, let's... Um, end this uh, with some discussion of the broader implications of the scandal for U.S. foreign policy in general, right? And so we're going to start with a final clip from PBS that highlights some of the larger dilemmas that we've already uh, raised facing U.S. foreign policies in situations like this and this tension between uh, strategic interests and um, uh, moral considerations of, of American values. So let's roll that clip now. Uh, David, Mark brought up uh, the, the Jamal Khashoggi uh, uh, disappearance a minute ago, the Saudi journalist. Uh, we've been hearing about that now for several weeks. I think just tonight, uh, the Saudi government uh, is saying they are firing people, uh, asking people to step down. They're detaining others uh, in all this. We still don't have a clear picture of what the Trump administration is going to do. Uh, how do you see, can the president walk a middle line here at the one on the one hand say yes it was a terrible thing but we don't want to we don't want to in in a serious way change our relationship with the saudis well that's what's going to happen uh, in the middle east people understand you go through periods where people have to pretend to be mad at you and then they go back to normal affairs and i suspect that's what the trump administration is going to do with saudi arabia <laughs> to me the prior problem is that whoever made the decision in saudi arabia to do this didn't worry about donald trump didn't worry about america uh, and if the U.S. withdraws its normal role as the enforcer of some sort of international decency, then the people like Putin, the people like those in Saudi Arabia, the people like those in North Korea are just instinctively and almost unconsciously going to think, well, I can get away with this. Uh, and so you get actions like that. So it's almost the prior withdrawal of American power uh, and standard setting that seems to be the core problem. And then when you look at the Trump administration reaction, this happens every time they align themselves with a bad person, whether it's Putin or this or, or another. The bad person does something bad. They try not to react because they like the bad person. And then public opinion drags them into some grudging, meaningless uh, acknowledgement. And that's sort of the pattern here. OK. So, so this um, commentary, and there's been a lot of this out there, is, is about this relatively weak and kind of halting uh, 
critical reaction to Saudi Arabia that may cost uh, the United States uh, more authority and arguably some strategic um, interests. And, and so you got to think about this uh, in terms of uh, a tension between competing national interests. There is a national interest, I would argue, in, in standing up for American values. And the United States um, sort of bears some uh, responsibility for that. It wants to, if, it, if it's going to sort of see itself as a, a country that has certain values and principles, then it's when, when things like this happen, it needs to uh, try to defend those. Um, but then there's also in cases when your allies engage in those kinds of actions, there are um, strategic, economic, and political interests at play too. And, and you have to decide, does uh, the United States risk a historical relationship and an alliance like it has with Saudi Arabia over a crisis like this? And, and there was a New York Times op-ed um, just yesterday by John, John, uh, James Baker, uh, former uh, George H.W., the first Bush administration official. And he argues that the United States does have to balance uh, standing up for its values and protecting its strategic interests on both ends. And he cited an example of the Bush uh, administration, the first Bush administration, in its response to uh, China during the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. And he called that a, a balanced uh, response in the sense that it was very critical, it, it applied sanctions, it, it, it applied punishments, but at the same time, it tried to maintain the strategic relationship so that it didn't lose um, everything in terms of this strategic interaction with China, but it also stood up for its, its principles. If you think about this, there's a, there's a risk on the other side. If, if you overemphasize, if you will, strategic interests, you could um, have a problem in terms of moral authority and consistency. So can the United States effectively counter bad behavior by adversaries like Iran or Russia if it doesn't hold its allies accountable uh, for acts of like killing journalists. And, and we have an example uh, related to this particular crisis. Russia has chimed in on the Khashoggi affair and, and, and uh, President Putin has criticized the United States for its reaction to this crisis. And they make, Putin makes a very, um, uh, you know, specific point about this. He says the United States and its European allies acted very quickly in placing sanctions on Russia for the poisoning of two Russian nationals, Sergei and Yulia Skripal, in Great Britain. And, the, and he says, at least Putin says, there wasn't any concrete evidence that Russia was involved. Um, and yet there were sanctions uh, applied on and Russia. And, and, and Vladimir Putin asked publicly at, at this forum yesterday uh, why Saudi Arabia, which is apparently getting uh, different treatment uh, by the United States, at least for now, despite credible allegations that it was involved in the killing of a Saudi citizen on a, in a foreign country. This double standard thing is, is causes some problems. So, Can I say a couple things? Yeah. And let me go back to the UN speech that we talked about a couple weeks oh, right. ago. So why was that so significant in terms of the content of US grand strategy? It embraced the norms and rules associated with sovereignty which basically says, we're gonna let you guys and let the rest of the world decide to do what they want in, term, in their own domestic political systems. The US is not gonna tell you anymore what to do. What does that mean? It means the US is stepping back from democracy promotion, it's stepping back from human rights protections, and it's saying we, we need to find a way to live with autocrats around the world. And so I'm announcing effectively new constraints on American grand strategy. Remember the last 70 years in terms of how we've been promoting democracy and human rights? We're stepping back from that because this has gotten us into a lot of problems. Iraq is the big example of this in the Bush administration. So we're reorienting the moral foundations of American grand strategy. We're gonna be less concerned with promoting individual freedoms around the world, okay? This is one of the consequences of this policy, right? And this is what David Brooks is talking right. about that. You know, what he says, why isn't, why isn't, for me, right, he says, for me the bigger problem is, why didn't somebody in Saudi Arabia say this was gonna be a problem with the United States if we whacked this journalist, right? 
And what he's saying is nobody was asking that question because they clearly went ahead and did. They didn't think it was going to be a problem. Exactly, right. right. And so this is, this is what's going on here is part of a broader reorientation in American grand strategy that we've been talking about. Um, and this is a significant change, right? And we want to draw your attention to this. And you can make an argument that what happened over the last month is a product of that reorientation in American grand strategy.